Good afternoon and welcome to Monticello's Unsolved Mysteries, an exploration of a few missing things um, at, from Monticello that my colleague Diane and I are going to present to you. Uh, my name is Emily Johnson. I'm an associate curator here at Monticello. And I also want to make sure to introduce um, our curatorial intern this summer, Maggie Peltapals. And Maggie will be helping us by fielding questions and comments. So please um, ask us anything about objects missing from Monticello. We're going to focus on four things in particular uh, this afternoon. And we, we please put your comments into the chat and Maggie will share them with us. And I want to say, we'll say this again, that if you have any leads, um, these are all cold cases. Right. They're all open. That's right. This is not a hollow exercise. This is the real deal. No, we, we, we're hoping these things are out there. And so there's more to come. There is a lot more to come. <laughs> so if you have any leads, please reach out to us at preserving at monticello.org. Thanks, and we'll get started. Great, great. Thank you, Emily and Maggie. And we look forward to love uh, that shows you what an amazing group of people we work with. Also, I don't know if I want to say cleverness. Our, our scholarship and our um, uh, innovative thinking, sleuthing. yeah, our sleuthing in order to get us to where we know about these four objects. And I want you to think about times in your own lives or in your family's um, experience when objects have moved uh, within households. And that's a really important part about uh, what we curators um, take into consideration. So, you know, a friend's daughter recently got married. That's a move and new household, a gift for move, and you finally get to get rid of your, your you know, adult children's stuff, things move. <laughs> um, and also, uh, most particularly, when someone dies, uh, and then you have an estate situation. And uh, today, we think, most importantly, these objects probably moved uh, um, following Jefferson's death uh, in 1826, as you know, uh, this very month. And um, there was a dispersal sale in January 1827. And we want to mention that, uh, point out that many, many objects were sold that day. But of course, you know, the most poignant and refreshing was the number of enslaved And we have an amazing um, previous live stream with our colleagues event. So please go to our website and learn more about that dispersal sale. Um, but as far as objects today, I wanted to talk about, well, our biggest object on our list today is one of the biggest objects that is at Monticello. Um, I am looking for a library bookcase, and I want to show you where it once stood here uh, at Monticello. It was in a square room for those of you who've visited us, you know it's the first room you enter after leaving the hall. It's a rather small space, and um, you would know it as Jefferson's daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, used it as her sitting room. But that actually didn't become her domain uh, until 1816, after Jefferson sells his books to Congress. Um, and now you can see this one wall. It's a uh, in between the threshold, the doorway, when you enter the room from the passage, and a window. And it's, believe it or not, it's not actually the largest wall one could find in a home, but it, it's one of the biggest rooms in what was Jefferson's complete private suite. And um, when Jefferson enlarges Monticello II, he adds on this room, and it's a perfect square space. And we understand now that this is this room that he called his book room. And it was full of a, a large part of Jefferson's library um, with bookcases, probably some hanging bookcases. And then these, this book collection continued on into what's more familiar to us today is the private suite. So on that wall, you might remember we recently had, for, for actually quite a while, we would show family portraits um, and evoke you know, the, the experience of family at Monticello. 
But what was really there was a library bookcase, what 18th century um, or um, in Thomas Chippendale's pattern book it would have been called a library bookcase. Sometimes it's called a gentleman's bookcase. This would have been the Cadillac, the, uh, you know, the, the Gucci of the, uh, the height of aspirations. If you were a gentleman uh, of a certain class, if you were well-educated, if you were a lawyer, this was the biggest, most expensive, impressive piece of case furniture that you could acquire. And amazingly enough, our, not surprising, our guy had one. And we know the only wall that it could even have fit on is the wall that we're showing bare today. And we believe that this object looked very much like uh, the drawing I'm showing you, uh, which is the basis for a print in Thomas Chippendale's pattern book, um, which Jefferson actually owned this pattern book. Um, it had um, patterns for chair styles and cabinets and tables and fire screens and a number of different desks. So it was not unique to Jefferson, this style. Uh, it was published and um, he you know, probably had access either of course his own pattern book or at a craftsman shop. And we believe that this piece was almost certainly made in Williamsburg, probably around 1770. And um, I love the drawing because if you look carefully, there are some inked notations. This piece, I believe it says it's huge for scale. We're talking eight, nine feet wide. It was certainly built in a number of parts um, so that it could be disassembled and moved. You couldn't even possibly deal with such a large piece without it having been constructed like that. And it's a little difficult to see, but if you could use our lovely pink pointer there and just make out that they've delineated a bit of a shadow, that the center section projects forward just slightly. We're talking probably given the scale of this piece, maybe it steps forward six inches or so. Um, and what it's um, beneath those uh, rectangles you're seeing, those are really cupboard doors and there were shelves in there um, to hold papers, folios, books and so on. And of course the top was intended as a bookcase. I'm doubtful that Jefferson had a pediment on his, although he could have, that's the, triangular portion at the top, the classical element there. Uh, could we show them the page, the title page from the cabinet uh, director? Uh, very common book to, for people of a certain class. And like I already said, Jefferson owned this book, uh, the 1762 edition. So we know very pretty good idea exactly what we're looking for. And um, the real clue that got me going, there were two, but the, the most exciting clue for me was uh, this drawing that I would like to show you next. Ah, okay, we'll show you, we'll do the drawing. So a little difficult to see, but the large rectangle there, yes, I think it's labeled F. This is from a letter that Jefferson sends back from Paris in 1789, after he's been buying books for five years and he's already doing the math I don't know if he did the weight, because can you imagine how much weight all of those books gathered in one space? What he's done is configured how he can configure his existing bookcases, as well as having some filler bookcases made to store all of his new library when he comes back. And if you're inside, you can see he, he carefully draws the or he often called this type of case furniture a press. Um, it is much larger than all the other ones. It's this sort of narrow rectangle. And again, he carefully draws that it has that little bump out. So when I look at that, I don't know what that is. I know this is exactly gone for, for broken. Bookcase money could buy. Um, so if you could go back so people can better envision what this um, piece looked like. Now, example, they're, they're actually hard to find a good image. Um, Jefferson's would have not, would have been sort of plain, beautiful, highly figured mahogany without that inlay and all that you see. But it could have very easily had um, this ornate muntins in the glass uh, doors up above. 
And again, you can see uh, how this center section projects forward. So we're talking a very large piece of furniture, mahogany, um, multiple parts, made in Virginia around 1770. And um, in working on Jefferson's papers and understanding how he recorded them, he had, you know, um, participated in, um, he wrote around 19,000 letters. He received around 28,000 letters. All of these letters had to be filed as well as being um, a patriarch and a lawyer. So he had lots of estate documents in his law cases. Those things all needed to be stored somewhere. And this really would have been the first storage piece that he had early on. So we know it went into this room on that wall and ex so excited to find this document that's in mass historical. If you could show, show um, the note, I love this. This is Jefferson being organized. This, he tells us that this is press A and he had eight presses A through H and we, we own some other ones that have you know, some of the labels left, like we have press C. Um, but here you can see just at the top next to the A, that circle, that's not, that is actually a hole in the paper where he took a nail and he tacked this on the inside of the door on press A somewhere. And so when he opens the door, he knows exactly what's inside there. And um, the amount of material that he's listing clearly indicates this was a very large piece of furniture where he kept his law books, estate papers, and so on. So, but how do you use such a huge piece of I know, this, this wouldn't be easy. It would, this would have literally been wagon loads to get this away from Monticello. But um, because it's press A, and it had all these papers, uh, when Jefferson dies, his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, is the executor and one thing the family is very keen to do is to get Jefferson's papers, circulating them, trying to publish important papers and it goes volumes out there in order to make money for the family. Yeah. 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 So A in its part with its contents was very quickly loaded up on multiple wagons and taken to uh, this grandson's There it sat, probably, people didn't really mention it. It might be on inventory, we'll talk about it later. That is the best hunch. There's also a small chance that Jefferson's daughter, Ellen Coolidge, um, the family talks about um, Ellen's press and when the books were removed, we promised Ellen that she could have it. So there's a chance this was loaded on a ship and sent to her home in Boston, and that would have been around 1828. So if you're up north, don't discount. If you happen to know where one of these is, there is a, a very good chance that it started life here, um, or it might be in a home in Albemarle County or somewhere nearby. So those, that's where the trail goes cold, but I know it won't stay that way. Um, image I wanted to share just so you can get of um, in an upper class library. This is a great English country house, uh, a painting of um, Sir Howe doesn't, I'm, I'm forgetful of who this Lord and Lady, but it's Nostel Priory. And if you look carefully in the back, you can see if you're very wealthy, you can have an entire run of these library bookcases. But in the far right, you can see a white pediment there. That's essentially what we're talking about and how these objects were used and truly just how incredibly upper class these were, how rare they were to have uh, in your home. So it's out there. I'm, I'm not giving up on it yet. Emily, what you're working on. Sure. So actually, this is a great image to start um, because this image kind of encapsulates so it's a many good one. things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, really handy for this English couple to have so many of our you know, stand-ins for our lost they're objects. Show off. Exactly. Um, but Diane, kind of what you were talking about with the cultivated, you know, a, a cultivated livelihood, um, a gentleman's education, another sort of 
essential accessory for a cultivated, educated gentleman is a globe. So I want you all to look right behind that gorgeously dressed lady um, in her beautiful dove gray silk gown. If you notice on the desk is a, is a globe. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about next are um, Jefferson's globes. And if I could go forward. Should we quick foreshadow? Let's oh, force it, sure. just because uh, we've got a bus coming. That's true. And with, there's some paintings coming. And there's some paintings coming. So it's all in yeah. here. So here. That's right. <laughs> so just stay with us. We'll get there. That's true. OK. Absolutely. So that's a good point. But yeah, let's go to the, let's look at the globes first. Um, and then once, as we, as we shift images, um, there's another beautiful 18, uh, 1800 image of a gentleman's cultivated library. Well, let's go to the cabinet too, because um, this is going to be kind of our essential place for knowing what these globes are, um, where they are, and I'll talk about how we know where they were in just a few minutes. But um, Jefferson had a pair of 18-inch globes made by a, a British maker named Barden, um, B-A-R-D. And Jefferson had been after a pair of globes since at least 1792. And actually, he went to um, George Washington's terrestrial globe. So there's two types of globe. Terrestrial globe that shows land masses. Um, the other type, which you can actually see really beautifully in this image in the cabinet, is a celestial globe. Celestial globes show the skies. Um, it shows um, stars and constellations and planets and things like this. So Jefferson had been after a pair of globes since at least 1792. He tries to buy Washington's terrestrial globe at Washington's estate sale, but he's thwarted. And so finally, in 1805, Jefferson puts in an order with a British scientific instrument, per, instrument seller. Um, for this very specific maker and very specific size of globes. And so can we go to my next image? We'll go back to, you've seen, you've seen this crew before, um, but once we, get, once we get up, and then I will show you, if we can flip to the next image, um, another highly cultivated library um, with a globe prominently featured on the library table in the center of the room. I look at this room and I think I could really get some good stuff done in here. This is a really high style level of um, thing out and furnishing for a space. Um, and I think we forget because of our access to information and maps, but these, these were vital tools. They, you know, both images, they're front and center. People are using them. They were really important. Absolutely. So if we can go to the next, um, I think my next is I have a close-up of um, a pair of globes. These are 18-inch terrestrial and celestial globes made by Barden. Um, we bought these a couple of years ago because we know we had such good information on what Jefferson had. Yeah. And this pair became available, and they were a really good fit for us as stand-ins. But of course, we love period stand-ins when we, when we have them. They can be really wonderful, but the originals may be out there. And if we ever were able to find the originals, that would, of course, be our ultimate goal. It would be exciting. Can we go to the next? So Jefferson finally orders this pair in 1805. They arrive to the president's house in Washington in 1806, and they come down to Monticello in 1807. And it seems that they stay at Monticello through the rest of Jefferson's life. We believe that Jefferson, based on Jefferson's invoice with the London sellers, Jefferson had the globe in the top left corner of this broadsheet. So he had the shortest, simplest little stands. Um, this was a, you know, it was the cheapest and the simplest available, but yet still at this very high level maker. But Jefferson did soup his up a little bit. He had a pair of red leather covers a compass and an hour reader. So these are accessories that more often went on the slightly fancier stands, but he went with these more restrained, simpler, and yes, a little bit cheaper. We go to the next. And so how do we know 
these things. Well, we have Jefferson's order, but we also have this wonderful list. It's an undated list, so we don't know exactly what it when it dates from, but Jefferson made a list that he called his mathematical apparatus. And on this list, he writes down things that he has, sometimes things that he wants, but I really like, if you see, the second notation um, is this pair of globes. And he's got that nice little check mark out in the left-hand margin. I love that check mark because that oh, check mark the is like- The list for yes, press A. This. <laughs> Who knew he was so organized? I know, we <laughs> love that about Jefferson most of the time. And then on the bottom, you might be wondering, how do we know where these were? Well, Jefferson's granddaughter, Cornelia, probably around the time of his death, made this extremely useful annotated floor plan. And I know Diane has used this extensively in her research. I've used it quite a lot. But number 26 is described as globes in Jefferson's cabinet, right under the ledger bars. So when you come to Monticello today and you walk through the house and you visit Jefferson's cabinet, you will see these two globes on either side of the door, on the floor, they're portable. He could pull them up onto a table or a workstation if he needed to access them. Uh, I might just throw in, it's a very small space for those of you True. who remember. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, you know, the one on offer in the top left is the only one that would slide underneath. The oh, exactly, that's true. So, and little, he may have known, the space-saving globes. Yeah, he may have known that's where he wanted, probably yeah. knew that's where he wanted to put them. Yeah. Jefferson's very forward-thinking about his his purchases and his intentions for how things yeah. how are could placed all fit at together. Yeah. So can we go to the next? Yeah. So what happens to them, Emily? What happens? What happens? What happens? Well, Diane mentioned things move at big life events, like marriages, deaths. So this is Jefferson's grandson's receipt for what he purchased at the 1827 dispersal sale. And you see that it includes quite a number of people as well as objects. And the detail blown up, you see at the very end of the list, one pair of globes for $66. Wow. Yeah. So the original price was about eight, eight guineas, which I'm really bad in my conversion yeah. to yeah. 19th century or 18th century British currency. But um, you'll see that these are fairly highly valued. And you know, at this point, these globes are, well, they are 20 years old. So they might have started to show a little bit of, of wear. They might, you know, they've, they've been unconditioned spaces for 20 years. That tells me that there was a bidding war going on. Sixty-six dollars so. is high. very high. People must yeah. have known that these were really important to yeah. Jefferson and were a, a valued object mm -hmm. purchased by his his son-in-law. Um, can we go? I think that may be oh. the the last. But so after this, the globes appear on Thomas Jefferson Randolph's. Je Thomas Jefferson Randolph lives until 1875, and he remains here in Albemarle County, Virginia. The globes appear on an, on an estate um, inventory at the end of his life, but they don't, they're not dispersed by his will, and we don't really know what happens to them after 1875. So those of you who are local. Last known sighting, right here. Last known here. sighting, right Just here. Just within, you know, you know cannon shot. Away, yeah. um, in 1875. So if any of you have seen anything, um, globes are one because they have, a, they have a stamp. So if it's still readable, um, you might be able to see the and a date. So let us know. I think we have a question on the discovery here. Yes, we have a question. Um, and then it's about the dispersal sale. Do you think at the time of the sale after Jefferson's death, they would have published the sale in the paper? Yes. The, there was a, there was an account. Um, well, the, the, the sale was widely advertised in newspapers before the sale, uh, going as far as Richmond, as far as Washington. And they didn't give exactly a list of items, but um, on the website, and if you search, you'll see some of the um, advertisements. Few enticements in the pre sale ad, mm -hmm. which included a polygraph machine. The a bust of Thomas Jefferson by this artist 
Giuseppe Chirachi, who I'll be talking to you um, yeah. about. But there was also um, at least one newspaper account after the fact, sort of mm -hmm. describing what happened as far as what moved and what, what the day was like. But it, there was not a, a list of what was sold. Does that cover what they were? Yes. yes. Great, great question. We love questions. Yeah. Keep coming. Yeah. Keep them coming. All right. Well, so we've moved from the globes, but we are still in the cabinet. And if you could show another view, uh, we have some uh, really helpful footage. So here we are uh, in, in the cabinet, which I know you know is Jefferson's uh, workspace. We, very, all of you, all of you fans of Monticello are very familiar with the, the writing group, the revolving chair and the polygraph machine. And um, frequently on, on visits for years now, you've seen different portrait busts of uh, particularly uh, US presidents represented in the cabinet and in the library. And um, as part of working on the private suite and doing research and trying to identify exactly which examples of uh, which bust for each president was represented became something of a a search, we had thought that we uh, were correct in showing a bust of George Washington by um, the Udon, the famous French sculptor who Jefferson really supported and bought a number of busts from, including a bust of George Washington that uh, was shown in the tea room. Uh, but in trying to run that down, there was no evidence that he ever acquired two busts of George Washington by the same artist. And, uh, and really combing through the correspondence, um, I read more and more about this partnership or friendship that Jefferson had with a man named Thomas Appleton, an American a man from family from Massachusetts. And he was a um, essentially like a factor and sort of a diplomat stationed in Italy and his side gig was to provide Americans with everything marble. Marble fireplace surrounds, marble floor tiles, and he uh, was working with artists to create portrait busts um, and in different scales. So he approached Jefferson over the years trying to get him to purchase a bust of George Washington based on a life portrait that this artist, Giuseppe Chiracci, made when he came to America around 1792 or three. Uh, you might be familiar with the bust we have of Alexander Hamilton by this artist that's in the entry hall. He was extremely uh, highly thought of, and you can see that he's working in this um, ar more archeologically accurate um, classical style with the bare shoulder breastplate and um, he does a number of versions of how he chooses to represent George Washington. So Appleton tries to get him to buy the marble and Jefferson demurs and says, no, no, I can't afford it. Um, tell me how much it would cost in plaster. And then there's a long year's gap. And um, in finding exhibit catalogs up at the Boston Athenaeum, where Emily mentions um, that we'll be going there, but there were sales of Jefferson's art. Um, it became clear that Jefferson's granddaughter and grandson-in-law owned a bust of Columbus and a bust of Vespucci, which you say, what does this in the world have to do with George Washington? Um, we also know that these were marble busts. And as soon as I read that, knowing Jefferson's interest in a bust of George after Chirachi, Appleton arranged to have a trio of busts marketed to the American audience, which included George Washington, Vespucci, and Columbus. And they were all in this classical style and they were all in marble. And so it is quite clear, we all agreed, that the bust of George Washington in the cabinet would have been that bust by Chirachi. So what I'm showing you, we're very excited and appreciative that a friend of Monticello loaned us um, one of these two or three very rare examples that survive of this format that we believe is what Jefferson had. And much to my amazement in our conversations, this bus didn't even get here probably till around 1825. And he's very, very quiet about it. There's no letters about it. There's nothing in the memo book. 
So, you know, at this point, many of you know, and there's a lot of debt. So if he bought these, he might have tried to hide the purchase and he perhaps couldn't stop himself. They could have been a gift. They could have been sort of part of furnishing marble for UVA. So um, here we are, 1827, no mention of it. We don't know if it was sent to Boston to with the other art that was to be sold. Uh, or we know a few people managed to buy uh, some very fine quality art at the dispersal sale here at Monticello. So the two options, I think, I don't think it went to Boston or we would have heard in the family correspondence. I think it probably stayed here in the county and maybe went to Edge Hill, just like the large library bookcase, or someone bought it at the dispersal sale, paid cash that day, and it's gone. But we would love to find it. It's very specific, it's heroic, and it was a, clearly a piece of art that Jefferson appreciated and, and, and really you know, coveted for a very long time. Uh, so we were excited to realize it was here, and we want to realize and bring it back. So keep your eyes open. And Emily has more art for you to look at. Last thing, um, so if we can slide over to, um, to me and change portraits. So one of the, one of the pieces of, of parts of Jefferson's collections that have bedeviled curators for decades is Jefferson's collection of artwork. Um, we have several inventories and we know that Jefferson had, I believe, more than more than 80 works of art listed um, on an inventory that's available on our website. It's called the Catalog of Paintings and it's undated. We believe it, it dates from around 1809 to 1815 or so. And it only features works of art that were in the public spaces. So this is entrance hall, parlor, dining room, tea room. That's it. Nothing about the private suite, nothing about art in any of the other bedrooms in the house. Um, so it's a wonderful insight, but it is frustrating. So looking at the parlor, which you see here, um, there should be about 35 works of framed two-dimensional works of art in the parlor. And Jefferson organized it into tiers. So the upper tier is the top of the room, and that um, is where your larger paintings would have hung. They're, they're bigger paintings, so they're easier to see from the ground. As you come down closer to the ground, things get smaller and smaller. And we're focusing on this blank space above the fireplace because we're very, very lucky. We have an 1815 description of what hung in this space. A man named George Tickner, who was a Bostonian who came to visit Monticello, describes um, a painting of, I think he calls them the laughing and weeping philosophers over the mantelpiece. And so that is a wonderful piece of information because we have this list of paintings and it's literally a laundry list, like it's entrance hall, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, on and on and on. So we don't know where Jefferson started. We don't, you know, Jefferson doesn't say, I'm beginning my list in the southwest corner of the parlor, you know, above the pier mirrors. But with this notation from this visitor, we have this grounding. And so we can use that to start to build out the rest of the list. So let me move over to the PowerPoint. I want you to get a really good visual of where this is because you'll see this again coming soon. So if we can move back a few slides. Um, and we don't really have to start at the beginning. We can start, um, we can start, well, let's do start at the beginning. That's fine. I always like to start at the beginning. Um, this is a print of the uh, Salon in Paris. Uh, many of you who are fans of art, um, you know, know about the Impressionist exhibitions happening because they were rejected from the Salon. Well, this was the Salon in 1787. And you can see how densely it was hung, how just this, amazing almost wallpaper of image after image after image after image. I think to accommodate all of the works of art that Jefferson records on these catalogs, and there are multiple catalogs, there's one that's a little bit more prominent than others, um, but we must be thinking about something hung about like this, because think about it, you're moving you know, through all those doorways, you know, you're avoiding the pier mirrors, you're avoiding the mantel pieces, you're, you're not going to hang a painting on top of a window, of course. And so there's actually not that much wall space 
left once you once you <laughs> thanks to the wonderful yeah. windows and these wonderful mirrors that help to light the space. So let's move to the next. Um, this is a snippet from the document that I was talking about, the catalog of paintings. Um, and this is transcribed on our website, uh, which is a great help. The original, I believe, is at UVA. Um, and you'll see number 23, that's the piece that we really wanna focus on today, um, Democritus and Heraclitus. And if you'll forgive me, I had to cheat a little bit, but the description is really wonderful. I won't read it out for you. Um, I'm happy to read it out if someone has a question about it later, but it's a wonderful description of the subject that it's two figures sharing the world. It gives a size of the figures and it tells us where Jefferson bought the painting. So Jefferson purchased this painting from a 1785 sale in Paris. So this is pretty early in his time in Paris. This is probably one of his earliest art purchases um, as he's amassing this wonderful collection in Europe. And I wanna say one thing that this entry doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us the artist. And this, the maker of works of art is kind of a different thing for people in the late 18th and early 19th century than it is for us now. There, it's very, very common for people to copy a work after a master. Um, so you, many of you will know um, paintings by, I mean, Da Vinci is a little bit hard to copy because he's so specific, but there are many, many copies after people like Rubens, um, people like Raphael, and Jefferson collects these. And they're noted, you know, title of the painting after Raphael, after Rubens. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very common practice that we have here. Can I go to the next? And this is what we think the paintings might look like. Um, the Democritus and Heraclitus are two ancient Greek philosophers. And this was a very popular um, subject matter. They are depicted as one is laughing. I believe it is Democritus who is laughing and Heraclitus who is weeping, but someone is going to Wikipedia that and probably correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the one who is weeping or, or railing, as he's sometimes described, against the foibles of mankind. So these two philosophers are kind of battling it out over the sort of will of, of humankind. Um, and they're often depicted kind of going at it over this globe. Now, we, because we don't know which artist Jefferson's painting was after, both of these depictions actually fit the description of the painting we're given. And so it's a question, if we are going to make a reproduction of one of these, which one would we choose? And there are a couple ways that we could try to figure this out. Actually, in the sale catalog in 1785 from Paris, they give dimensions which is wonderful because then we know how much wall space this painting took. So we can look at these paintings and see if one of them is somewhat close to the dimensions. We can also look to see if either of these paintings were in Paris at the time, or if not these, was another example of Democritus and Heraclitus um, in Paris at this time. Um, I don't know. I, if I had to choose one of these two, I might slightly tend towards the Rubens. We, Jefferson seemed to like Rubens quite a lot. He had several examples of paintings after Rubens in the collection. So it might be more the one on the, on the left than, or I'm sorry, the one on the right than the one on the left. And if we can move forward. So one of the cool things that we're able to do with all of this information is make a digital mock-up of what this might have looked like. So this is a very old picture of the parlor. You know, you may remember from our, our video at the front um, that it doesn't look like this anymore. So just to kind of situate you back in the space, look at the mantelpiece, and if we can go to the next. This is using um, one of the examples of Democritus and Heraclitus uh, over the mantelpiece. We know it's on the upper tier, so it's at the very, very top. And what, how might it have looked? Let's go to the net. Well, well, this is where those dimensions, by him providing the dimensions, it's gold. It's a, it's a game changer. It's such a game changer. And let's go to the next. So we actually, we, we have suspicions that there might have been a larger mirror in this space, helping, you know, just really spreading the light that's coming in through the doors and the windows, candles when used, lamps when used, um, echoing the pier mirrors and really kind of 
this is right across from the doorway into the dining room. So there's this nice symmetry that's starting to happen here. And if we use a slightly larger mirror that we know Jefferson had, located above the fireplace, the painting fits just perfectly. And it's got that French monumental yeah. um, effect. And also it makes this amazing focal point. There's, Absolutely. there's sort of three focal points in the parlor. In the there's the self-action doors, there's the view to the west, and then there's this over the mat. I also like this one because the, they're actually almost looking down. Like <laughs> if you were in there yeah. having a, you know, little right. conversation or playing chess, these two are looming over you. You would you look know? up and they're looking down at you, so, you know, laughing and So and Emily, what happened to these so two guys? Happened? Where happened? did they what go? Happened? Can we go to the next? So again, you know, this is gonna be, you know, you guys are gonna get sick of us saying this. After Jefferson's death, um, there was great debt. There were large sales. Um, and as I think Diane has mentioned earlier, um, many of Jefferson's works of art, the two dimensional works of art, um, it's decided that it's better to send them up to Boston, that the market in Boston would be a little bit more robust um, than the market here in Albemarle County. So we know that the painting, and there's a lot of backing and forthing between the family about which paintings are in good enough condition to send. So you know, this, this is a, the, the painting is probably a 17th century, it's a, wreck. It's, a wreck. it's a wreck, it's a wreck, it's, it's a been wreck. hanging above a fireplace for at least the last, you know, 20 years. Um, it's dirty, it's dark. Um, so there's, there's a, actually a conversation and Martha Jefferson Randolph actually says, I don't know if this painting is in good enough condition to send, but apparently they decide to do so. It is offered at an exhibition of Jefferson's works um, at the Boston Athenaeum in 1828. And then very few paintings out of that exhibition actually sell, only one does. So five years later, they try again. They hope the market has changed. And there's a gallery up in Boston that offers a number of Jefferson's paintings, including this one listed at number two on the catalog. But we don't know, we don't have a good set of receipts from the Boston sale. We don't know, we only know in I think one case who actually purchased one of the paintings. We don't even know if all the paintings were sold. This one may not have even sold. Yeah. Um, they might have thrown in the towel and said, okay, no one said, wants forget it. Forget it, fine. But it's it just, was in Boston. But it was in Boston in 1833. So- Last known sighting in Our Boston. friends in New England, <laughs> if you've ever seen a that's right. Somewhat, you know, it's a yeah. it's a striking image. Yeah. Um, or if your mom I'll took say. a kind of beat up <laughs> painting of two men looming over a globe mm -hmm. when she moved to Florida, we want to know about we it. We would love right? to know about it. We know so. that they, things move, things travel. Things definitely move. And things survive, even even things that you think may not. Um, it's, it's amazing how things can survive. Yeah. We're surprised all the time. So we, th these are things we're looking for. This is the tip of the iceberg of things we're looking for. But if there are some questions, I know we yeah. have taken your long lunch uh, quite, quite into the afternoon, but um, if there's any questions. Keep our comments. unsolved mysteries yes. in mind. Yeah. And there are gonna be more of these. We've really started yeah. to make a good list of things that we yeah. know were here and have gone. Yeah. Missing we should also say, years. so again, preserving Monticello, yeah. please send us leads or comments or other questions. Mm -hmm. And we invite you to come visit us and see what we have brought back. Right. You know, yeah, we're here, right. Monticello is waiting for you and uh, we would be excited to see you here. Absolutely. So, well, well great. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Yeah. It's always fun to be here with you yeah. all. Thank you. <laughs>